Greetings, I'm Dr. Carl Nath, the Editor-in-Chief of Mayo Clinic Proceedings, and I am pleased to welcome you to the Multimedia Summary for the Journal's October 2018 issue. There are four articles this month that have been selected as our Editor's Choice or Highlights articles. Our Editor's Choice is an original article entitled Acute Myocardial Infarction During Pregnancy in the Propyrium in the United States and it is authored by Dr. Nathaniel Smilowitz and colleagues from the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The risk for acute myocardial infarction during pregnancy is increased because of the hormonal and hemodynamic changes and the hypercoagulable state that occur in pregnancy. The occurrence of acute myocardial infarction during pregnancy imposes high risks for both the mother and the fetus. Investigation of acute myocardial infarction during pregnancy is challenging because of the relatively low incidence of this complication during pregnancy and its heterogeneous clinical presentations. In the present study, the authors utilized a large database, the National Inpatient Sample Database, to analyze trends in the incidence in-hospital management and outcomes of acute myocardial infarction complicating pregnancy and the puperium in the United States. Using this database, women 18 years or older were identified who were hospitalized during pregnancy and the puperium from January 2002 to December 2014. ICD-9 diagnosis and procedure codes were used to identify acute myocardial infarction during pregnancy-related admissions. Overall, more than 55 million pregnancy-related hospitalizations were identified. A total of 4,471 cases of acute myocardial infarction occurred, representing approximately 8 cases per 100,000 hospitalizations. More than 50% of cases occurred in the postpartum period, with little more than 20% of, of cases occurring either in the antepartum period or during labor and delivery. ST segment elevation myocardial infarction occurred in 42%, and non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction occurred in 58% of cases. Among patients with pregnancy-related acute myocardial infarction, 53% underwent invasive management and 25% underwent coronary vascularization. In-hospital mortality was substantially higher in patients with acute myocardial infarction than those without acute myocardial infarction during pregnancy, with an adjusted odds ratio approximating 40. Invasive management was independently associated with lower mortality. The rate of acute myocardial infarction during pregnancy and the puperium increased over time during which this analysis was conducted. The authors conclude that in patients hospitalized during pregnancy or the puperium, acute myocardial infarction occurred in one out of every 12,400 hospitalizations. The rates of acute myocardial infarction increased over time and maternal mortality rates were markedly increased. These authors emphasize the need for additional research on the prevention and optimal management of acute myocardial infarction during pregnancy. Our first highlight is an original article entitled Overall and Cause-Specific Mortality of Inflammatory Bowel Disease in Olmsted County, Minnesota from 1970 through 2016 and it is authored by Dr. Satimai Ativan from Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota and Chulalong Korn University, Bangkok, Thailand and by colleagues from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. During the past two decades, the management of inflammatory bowel disease has changed substantially due to increased use of immunomodulators, earlier introduction of biological agents, improvement in surgical techniques, and increased awareness of colorectal cancer surveillance. 
On the other hand, some of the medications used to treat inflammatory bowel disease may cause quite serious adverse effects, including infections and malignancies. The overall impact of more effective management of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, possibly offset by the potential adverse effects of these neurotherapies on the hard endpoint of mortality, currently remains unresolved. Studies addressing this issue in different countries have often reached different conclusions. In the present study, all 895 residents of Olmsted County, Minnesota, first diagnosed as having inflammatory bowel disease, 411 with Crohn disease, and 484 with ulcerative colitis, from January 1970 through December 2010, will follow through June 2016. Standardized mortality rates were computed, expected rates were derived from the U.S. 2010 background population. To determine overall and cause-specific mortality, each patient with inflammatory bowel disease was matched with five county residents without inflammatory bowel disease, and Cox regression analysis was used to assess time to death. The data demonstrate that 74 patients with Crohn's disease died as compared with 59 expected, with a standard mortality ratio of 1.25. As regards ulcerative colitis, 77 patients with ulcerative colitis died compared with 108 expected, with a standardized mortality ratio of 0.7. In Crohn's disease, the risk of dying was significantly associated with a diagnosis from 1970 through 1979, with a standardized mortality ratio of 1.90. Of those diagnosed after 1980, the risk of dying in patients with Crohn's disease was similar to the U.S. background population. In ulcerative colitis, as compared with the U.S. background population, the risk of dying was less than expected in all periods of diagnosis. However, the overall mortality in ulcerative colitis was comparable with that of Olmsted County residents without inflammatory bowel disease. In the Cox regression analysis, Overall mortality was not significantly higher in Crohn's disease with a hazard ratio of 1.26 or in ulcerative colitis with a hazard ratio of 0.89 when compared with the comparison cohort. The risk of dying of digestive diseases and respiratory diseases was significantly increased in Crohn's disease but not in ulcerative colitis. The authors conclude that in this cohort Overall mortality in patients with Crohn's disease diagnosed after 1980 did not differ from that in the U.S. background population. Overall mortality in patients with ulcerative colitis diagnosed from 1970 through 2010 was lower than the expected mortality in the U.S. background population, but comparable with that of Olmsted County residents without inflammatory bowel disease. The fact that Olmsted County residents without inflammatory bowel disease in the age range 20 to 60 years have been shown to have lower mortality rates as compared with the U.S. population may underlie these comparative findings in ulcerative colitis. The authors suggest that the reduction in mortality in Crohn's disease from 1980s onwards reflect improvement in the management of Crohn's disease occurring during the 1980s and 1990s, along with the recognized reduced incidence of smoking from 1980s onwards in patients with Crohn's disease. The second highlight is an original article entitled Food Allergy, a Comprehensive Population-Based Cohort Study and it is authored by Dr. Aaron Willits from the Intermountain Medical Group, Sandy Utah, and colleagues from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Food allergy is a growing public health concern that has received increased attention in recent years. Food allergy is a major social stressor for families. 
It impairs the quality of life for patients and their families. It imposes health care costs. It increases the utilization of outpatient and inpatient health care, and it incurs the loss of productivity. A telephone-based survey found increasing rates of peanut allergy in children from 1997 to 2007. However, given the uncertainties of data derived from self-reporting and the absence of relevant longitudinal data, whether food allergy prevalence is truly increasing remains unresolved. In 2000, the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Nutrition published guidelines recommending the delay in the introduction of allergenic foods including milk, egg, peanut, and shellfish. In the years following these recommendations, food allergy experts became concerned about the rising trends of food allergy in children, and several observations suggested that the early introduction of potentially allergenic foods such as peanut may prevent such food allergy. Indeed, addendum guidelines for the early introduction of peanut have been published that reverse the prior recommendation to delay introduction of allergenic foods. In light of these considerations, accurate delineation of the incidence and temporal trends of food allergies is an important and timely undertaking, and this is the objective of the present study. The authors performed a historical cohort study to describe the epidemiology of food allergies among residents of all ages in Olmsted County, Minnesota, during a 10-year period from January 2002 through December 2011, using the Rochester Epidemiology Project database. Overall incidence and trends in biannual incidence rates over time were evaluated. During the 10-year study period, 578 new cases of food allergies were diagnosed. The average annual incidence rate was significantly higher among males as compared to females, with an overall rate of 3.6 per 10,000 person years. The pediatric incidence rate of food allergy increased from 7 to 13.3 per 10,000 person years between 2002-2003 and 2006 and 2007 calendar periods and then stabilized at approximately 12 per 10,000 person years in the last two calendar periods. Milk, peanut and seafood were the most common allergens in infancy, in children between the ages of 1 and 4 years and in the adult population respectively. This study is one of the first population-based studies in the United States to examine the temporal trends of food allergies. It demonstrates that the incidence of food allergies increased markedly between 2002 and 2009, with stabilization thereafter, with a high incidence in males as compared with females. The authors emphasized the need for additional longitudinal studies assesses changes in food allergy incidence, especially in light of changing recommendations regarding when allergenic foods should be introduced. The third highlight is an original article entitled Association of Statin Use with Mortality After Dialysis Requiring Acute Kidney Injury, a population-based cohort study. It is authored by Dr. Chia Lin Wu from Changhua Christian Hospital in Changhua, Taiwan, and colleagues from other institutions in Taiwan. Statins reduce low-density lipoprotein levels and are used in the primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Statins exert potentially beneficial effects beyond the lowering of LDL cholesterol including anti-inflammatory actions, antioxidant effects, and the induction of potentially cytoprotective genes. Indeed, there is some evidence that statins may be protective in diseases besides cardiovascular diseases. While the evidence is mixed and controversial, some studies have suggested that statins may protect against acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury 
especially of such severity that requires dialysis, is associated with significantly increased mortality and at an increased risk for chronic kidney disease. Any therapy that reduces either complication of acute kidney injury would be of substantial importance. The purpose of this study by Dr. Wu and colleagues was to investigate the association between statin use and mortality in patients with dialysis requiring acute kidney injury. This nationwide population-based retrospective cohort study included more than 6,000 hospitalized patients with acute kidney injury requiring dialysis, 1,271 statin users, and 4,820 statin non-users, retrieved from the National Health Insurance Research Database of Taiwan between January 2000 and December 2012. All the patients were followed up until December 2013. Primary and secondary outcomes were one year and in hospital mortality respectively. All the primary analyses were performed using the intention to treat approach. During one year follow-up, 39% of statin users and 49% of statin non-users died. After propensity score matching, statin use was independently associated with lower risks of one-year all-cause mortality with a hazard ratio of 0 0.79 and in-hospital all-cause mortality with a hazard ratio of 0 0.84. The survival benefit of statin treatment was dose-dependent, compliance-dependent, and consistent across subgroups based on sensitivity analyses. The authors conclude that statin use was independently associated with reduced risks of one year and in-hospital mortality in patients with acute kidney injury requiring dialysis. Statin therapy may thus be beneficial in this patient group. However, the authors emphasize the need for further clinical studies and clinical trials to validate these findings and to clearly determine the role of statin treatment in the optimal care of patients with acute kidney injury. You can access these highlights and editor's choice articles free of charge during the entire month of October when you visit our Mayo Clinic Proceeding website at www.mailclinicproceedings.org. You will also see other free content and articles published online ahead of print. You can find links to our social media by clicking the buttons at the top of the home page to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. On our YouTube channel, you'll find author interviews, 60 seconds video article summaries, and our Mayo Clinic Proceedings Fireside Chat Recordings, which are available from our website on the home page as well as through iTunes. You'll find our Pioneers and Legends video interview featuring Dr. James Dick. And finally, our website lists many news stories that are based on articles published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings. As always, we greatly thank you for your interest in and your support of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.